Welcome to I Found This Great Book, and today I have the honor to present an interview I conducted with the great Dr. Frankie Y. Bailey. Dr. Bailey, or Frankie as she likes to go by, is a professor of criminal justice at the University of Albany. She is a crime historian and she is also a mystery author. And she has two series of books, and we talk about that in the interview. She also is the creator of Frankie's List, which is on Sisters in Crime's website. And that is a list of Black authors, Indigenous authors, Hispanic authors, wide variety of mystery authors. Frankie is the creator of that list. And that list inspired me to start this podcast. So sit back and enjoy a fantastic time talking with the great Frankie Y. Bailey. I am speaking with one of my heroes, Dr. Frankie Y. Bailey. And Frankie, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me on. It is such an honor to speak with you. So I want to hop right into it. I want to respect your time, but I could ask, I could talk to you for five hours about mysteries, but I won't do that. <laughs> I'm flattered that you <laughs> think you could talk to me for five hours, but I probably get kind of boring after the first hour. I doubt that. I doubt that totally. <laughs> so you, besides being a professor of criminal justice, learned person that you are and uh, someone who studied mysteries, you are also an author of mystery. So let's talk about those. In your Lizzie Stewart mystery series, your sleuth is a crime historian. Is this yes. character based on you? Not really. I mean, some of my colleagues thought it might be when the uh, first book came out, but what is based on me is the fact that I study crime history, and that's relevant to the series because I was actually, when I, I wrote my dissertation in my hometown of Danville, Virginia, uh, I was looking at uh, crime at the turn of the century from 1900 to 1940, and there was a lynching incident that didn't really at first show up as an incident lynching when I was looking at it. But then I began to think about it. I wrote about it in my dissertation, and I wanted to really do something with that. I've been wanting to write a novel uh, because I started out uh, as an English and psychology major at Virginia Tech. So I really uh, wanted to write a novel, and that lynching incident, I thought if I fictionalized that and had a crime historian going to Gallagher to stand in for my hometown, and I added a murder, and... I wanted to do something where I'd link the present to the past and look at you know, how that was all a part of the history of that town. And that's how Lizzie was born. Although, actually, the first book ended up being set in Carmel, England, because I actually, it took me five years to write that book about the lynching. And so in the meantime, I'd taken my two characters, Lizzie and Quinn, my police homicide detective, and I took them to England with me on a vacation. I wrote a book set there. And then I came back and I had to change the plot of the book I'd been working on for five years hmm. because Lizzie met Quinn in Cornwall, England, uh, if you follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Wow. And I find it fascinating how you, you, you talk about the characters. Uh, so they move and do things on their own as you're writing or you have one plan and then the characters do other things. Is that true? Yeah, now that I know the characters so well, I mean, I've written five novels and three short stories featuring the characters. So now that I know them so well, and now that I know the setting so well, I can start out with a plot because I am a plotter. And then as it evolves, I can see things changing based on the interactions of the characters. So it's not that, as many people would say, I sometimes say the characters take over more there's something going on in my subconscious as I'm writing, and because I know them so well, I know how they would interact, uh, Lizzie and Quinn, uh, and the people around them, and that helps me to get to things that I might not have been thinking about as I plotted. I, I love talking with writers and hearing how they 
work that out, you know, because I'm, I'm fascinated because you, when you read, you're just like, how did they come up with that? <laughs> I think any writer you talk to, there's some things we all do alike, perhaps, in terms of you creating our characters, but there are other, we all have our, the way we approach the process. When we begin to write, for example, or how often we write, or whether we can listen to music, or you know, have to have you know, complete silence to write. Some people can write in a coffee shop, for example, and some people have to shut themselves up in a room with no disturbance at all, no one around them, not even a pet. So it all depends. You know, I have a cat, and sometimes the cat is walking by. Now that I'm working at home, my cat has often been in and out of my office, so I've had to learn to adjust to the cat jumping up on the desk or <laughs> studying a very large cat <laughs> on my keyboard as I'm working. You know, so those kinds of things you learn to work around <laughs> are used to your advantage as you're writing. Yeah, definitely. And, and it is funny how cats never seem to uh, respect the fact that you're working. Me. No respect at all. My cat is a Maine Coon Mitz, a very large cat with a very large voice. And he was relentless. He'll just sit there, you know, go on and on, giving me that cat stir, waiting for me to get up and beat him. So <laughs> it's a different kind of thing than when I was going into the office at campus every day and then coming home and writing uh, in the evening and weekend. Now, you also have another series. And uh, in this series, your Detective Hannah McCabe series, you set these in the near future. Yeah, when I started writing, it was the near future because I was writing in uh, 2017 and the first book in the series, uh, The Red Queen Dies, was set in 2019. And then I was writing the second book and it was set in uh, early 2020. But now, of course, the present has caught up with my future. And when I get around to setting, writing another book in the series, because I had a contract only for the first two, but I want to do a third and some others. Uh, but when I get to the third, I'm going to be writing in an alternate universe, a uh, parallel universe. So however that plays out, where I'm going to be writing in the present and Hannah McCabe is going to be in my present, but in an alternate version of Albany, New York. So it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, I, I like that because uh, I think the books hold up because they do kind of roll into, like you said, uh, it's like an alternate future. So when you wrote that series, what were the big challenges? Well, I think the challenge was that I'm writing about a real place, Albany, New York. I live and work in Albany. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to use the history of Albany, but at the same time, I didn't want to imply in any way that the police department in my series was you know, the police department in Albany, real the real police department. I have a female mayor in my book and the real life Albany that never been a female mayor until recently. And after I'd written the book, uh, we had, as the book was, I think, being copy edited at the time, a woman won election as mayor. And so now I have a female mayor in my book and in my books and a female mayor in reality. Which, and you know, I don't want to imply in any fashion that you're know, this woman in the book, although she does nothing that you know, would be questionable in the book, but and she has only a minor role. I don't want to imply that this is who I'm writing about. Mm. And so, as the book was coming out, I avoided meeting this woman in person. I've only met her in the last couple of years, a couple of years ago, because I didn't want to. I wanted to have deniability, so I could say, yeah, I, I've never met her. You know, <laughs> so it was. Uh, because Albany isn't a huge city, so it's hard to avoid meeting someone if you're going around in the same circles. But I deliberately did that because I didn't want to have that. But uh, the other challenge was, although I'd done research on police policing, I know the process well. I had been involved in uh, research on stress and policing with two other you know, investigators, researchers. And I had written along with women police officers and their partners in the city that we were doing research on. So I had that background, so I could draw on that. But I would never actually written a police procedure, which is very different from the amateur sleuth kind of thing in that you are following the police as they go about the investigation. What are some of the challenges from going from one type of mystery to another or benefits? 
Uh, it was really interesting because Lizzie is in the first person. I know Lizzie incredibly well, but there are restrictions in the first person that you can only see what your uh, protagonist sees. I do keep now and then by adding a prologue or having a chapter from the point of view of a character like Lizzie's grandmother, for example, uh, in the second book in the series, that lynching book I mentioned, uh, because her grandmother was 12 years old and present at the lynching itself. I actually uh, introduced a grandmother uh, for a very brief period in the book to tell what was happening from her point of view. And then there's another prologue in the fifth book where I tell it from the victim as he is about to be killed, and then I pick up and go on. But that is a restriction with that with the first person um, that you can only, most of the story has to be told from that character's point of view, so you have to figure out how to actually show what the other characters are thinking, like Quinn, I have to find a way to have him you know, give his some sense of what he's thinking, what's going through his mind, even as Lizzie's telling the story. Because Lizzie's uh, point of view is influenced by who Lizzie is and how she perceives what's going on. So I have to find ways for other characters to somehow convey what they're thinking about what's going on without having them just say, and I'm thinking now, or something like that. Uh, with the police procedural, is told in the third person, including Hannah McCabe. And I do have the freedom of having multiple choice, multiple points of view as I go along. Uh, so I can have her, her partner, Mike Baxter. I can you know, go to a chapter from his point of view. I can go for, uh, to the soon-to-be victim's point of view. I can be out there and roam me around. So that gives me greater freedom. But I, even though I know Hannah well, I don't get as much into her head as I do with Lizzie because it's a completely different point of view and a different way of doing it. But it works really well for police procedural where you do want to follow multiple characters around. And, of course, now I'm working on a historical thriller, and oh. that's going to be really different. It's set in 1939. And I have two characters who are my primary characters and moving across the landscape of 1939. So the, the year self is the kind of character, as I have multiple settings. So that's a really different experience as well, both historical and multiple points of view. Okay, so that that right there, you've piqued my interest. When do you think we could see that historical thriller come out? Well, my agent has been saying, get it done, get it done. <laughs> and I had to figure out the structure. I mean, I, I've started this, I've been working on this for like several years now. Because I had done, because this is 1939, I is one of the time periods that in my nonfiction work I'm really interested in. Because so much was happening, there was the Nazi rally in New York City in 1939 at Madison Square Garden. And then there's Marian Anderson and her Easter performance at the Lincoln Memorial. And then the New York City World Fair, I've got Strange Fruit with Billie Holiday performing that at Cafe Society, and then the year ends up with the four-day uh, premiere of Gone with the Wind in Atlanta, Georgia. And so I follow that year, and my characters are moving across that landscape of that year. And one of the characters is a sleeping car porter, and the other is a young teacher who comes from Virginia to Harlem, and, and they're moving through that as well. So I have I have a lot of moving parts, but I'm finally now I finally have a structure where I, it will work, and so I'm trying very quickly to finish that first draft so that my agent can give me feedback and so I can get it wrapped up because I want to get it done. It's been hanging over my head too long, so I hope by 2021, you know, my agent will have stole it and it will be in press and coming out soon. Well, you have. One cell here. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> I Thank you. It's good to know. When I tell people about the premise, you know, they really like it. And so you know, my agent who loves historicals love it. Loves it. I've just got to get it written and get it you know, out there. That That's the hard part. I, I do understand. That's the hard part. <laughs> but I can see it in my mind. It's just that I've held on to it so long. I wanted to be... I want it to be perfect, and there's no way any book can ever be perfect. So I've just got to get it out there and let it go. Okay. Well, I, I am super excited. that Just all the events you said, that being that 
tapestry that you're painting this story on right there. I would pick the book up and say, I got to get it. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to write about that year because when I read about that year, when I think about that year, there's so many ways that all of these things are connected. And that's what I wanted to examine. And I introduced these characters. I wanted it to be a novel as just something that someone could read as a novel. But also, I want to write to that audience that would read this as a thriller, because I do have a murder and there's a plot and a conspiracy and all kinds of things going on. But I wanted to also stand on its own as a novel. So I'm probably over-ambitious for this. But oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I want to read it. Thank you. I will let you know when it's out. <laughs> Please do. Please do. Now, I know you're working on that story there, that novel. Do you ever plan to return back to the Hannah McCabe or uh, Stewart series? The Lizzie Stewart series is being reissued by Speaking Volumes. I had a small press over Mountain Press, and they did a great job with the book, but they went out of print when they they had an... Um, introduced briefly. It's a Southern uh, publisher, small publisher. And they had an, a mystery imprint briefly, and then you know, they did away with the imprint, and for years I was with, still with them, and they were bringing out a couple of more of my books. But then after that, you know, uh, they had moved away from mysteries, and so my books that were falling out of publication, still available, some of them, Amazon, and the favorite of my books of the five had actually sold out and fallen out of print. So Speaking Volumes offered to uh, reissue the book, and they're doing that now. The third book is about to come out, and the other two are coming. And as they're doing that, I'm working on the sit Lizzie Stewart book, which will hopefully be out as soon as the other two uh, in the series, or other three books in the series are out. Uh, and the nice part about this is now it's available on the series is available on Kindle and in paperback. So people who wanted the book on Kindle for so long can have found it there. And I have uh, Lizzie Stewart short stories that have been out since then, two in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, and then one came out in an anthology, and I'm probably working on another for an anthology that will be out. And Hannah McCabe, I intend to go back to her as soon as I finish the 1939 book and the next Lizzie book. Great. So you know readers are always bugging you about it. Oh, you going to write another one? Particularly the Lizzie Stewart readers because it's been a long time since the last novel. Definitely. Okay, well, I'm not going to harass you anymore because I'm waiting for the historical. And uh, <laughs> after that, I'll start emailing you. Okay, that was great. Can you give me another one? <laughs> I hope you like it when you read it. Oh, I'm I'm positive I will. So, your work as a professor in the field of criminal justice, your study, how is how did that affect your writing of mysteries and thrillers? Well, yeah, I mentioned I'm a crime historian, so I draw on I write uh, you know nonfiction for an academic audience, and for a general audience as well. I have, uh, In fact, most of my writing can be read by both uh, an academic audience and a general audience. So when I write uh, the Lizzie Stewart series, I'm drawing on my own research. So, for example, the books I talk about, you always have a crime in the past and a crime in the present, and my books are inspired in part by real-life events, a lynching, the execution of a, a young black woman, real-life execution. I read a dissertation. I did research on that crime, and, or that execution, crime and execution, I should say. And you know, I go out in the field and I do research. I do the research as if I were Lizzie. So when I'm writing about Lizzie going to Chicago in real life, I go to Chicago, or I went to Chicago, and I follow the path that she would follow as if she were investigating the crime that I insert into the real-life event. So she goes to Chicago and then to Wilmington, and then she goes on to pre-Katrina, New Orleans. And I did all of that. So I'm out in the field doing what she would do, and I'm drawing on the inspiration that I had and putting that into the book. So... For example, I'm right now I'm finishing up or have finished a nonfiction book about dress and appearance and justice and 
I came across the discussion and the image of a, um, a black coat, a cape, velvet cape that appeared in that this woman was modeling in this magazine I was looking at in real life. And when I was writing about Lizzie and a short story, I decided that I would build a short story around having Lizzie receive this coat in the mail and trying to figure out who sent it to her and why and getting into an investigation around this coat and what happened because of this coat and other things. And so I introduced those kinds of things into my story as I'm writing. With Hannah McCabe, I mentioned I'd done research uh, on policing and police women and their partners. So I, I'm actually dealing with, because it's near future, I'm drawing on the research about what will be happening in the near future. And so when I was writing the second book, I went out to Stanford University and had a chance to do what they allow members of the public to do and experience virtual reality and what it feels like to put on those goggles and see things uh, differently because of that. And so I, I draw that into my book, the whole you know, vertical garden. I, drew, I include that in my book. And so the whole idea of the type of drug that can change your reality, I have that in my book, those two books. So those kinds of things find their way into my books because I'm doing research and I want to write about it. But also I'm dealing with social issues. And in both of the books, I'm drawing on those issues. The Lizzie Stewart books are now in 2004, so they're in the recent past. The Hannah McKay book started out in the recent, recent future, and now they're alternate universe. Okay. So that was the long answer to your question, but that's no. how they affect their doing. Oh, fascinating. So you knew Eleanor Taylor Bland, and, and could you tell us a little bit about her? So Eleanor Taylor Bland, she died in 2010, about 10 years ago now. She really fascinating woman. She started out as an accountant and published her first mystery at that time in 1992. And she is actually, I would describe her as the mother of the African-American police procedural featuring a female character. She lived in Illinois, and she introduces the character Marty McAllister, who uh, lives, starts out in Chicago uh, and ends up as a policewoman in this small town, like Eleanor's small town. And she is she's writing a police procedural series. She had 14 books in the series before she died. Uh, and she had also been the editor of Gate the Black, published in 2004, which was an anthology featuring me and other African-American writers, mystery writers at the time. So Eleanor uh, was really impressive in that all the time she was, you know, much of that latter period of her life, she was suffering from a chronic illness and cancer. And she was all of that time out there trying to bring together the African-American writers. There were not many of us at the time, but you know, she was trying to find, uh, identify African-American writers, other writers of color, and bring us together so that we could you know, function as a group in terms of our shared interests. And as I was saying, you know, she actually edited, found, found a publisher for and edited this uh, Chase of Black in 2004 and gave you know, some of us uh, a chance to have our first short story published and other writers, who, uh, like Walter Mosley, who had already been published, you know, she brought uh, him into the project and really got it out there and promoted it. And so she was always a cheerleader for other writers and trying to you know, find a way to help us move forward in terms of getting our works published. And you know, she was, aside from that, a really great writer. I really admire what she did with her series. And she had 14 you know, novels. And in those novels, she was dealing with trying to bring the sense of what it was like, or what it's like for African Americans in terms of family, and you know, that he makes her character a widow, who is the white police detective in Chicago, who is killed, and then she moves to this small town, and so she has this extended family of her children, and her mother, and she brings other people into the family. Her character, her partner is Polish, and he and his wife become a a part of that family. And so it's all about creating family and community and how this woman interacts with the people around her. And 
So, you know, as Eleanor said, you know, that is one of the things that's a characteristic of many books and short stories by writers of color that we are interested in, you know, the people around us in terms of having a character as children and a family life and even pets. She has you know, a pet in the family, and that's not unique to your know, writers of color, but the fact that this, these animals are part of that family life uh, is so much of what she does. And it's a very multicultural kind of theory in terms of the people she has passing through the series and a part of the series. Yeah, I, I haven't read any of her books yet, but I think that might be my 2021 project to read all her books. You should start with the first book in the series and move through it because okay. the characters evolve and change as they go along. The Sisters in Crime, this is organization for crime writers, female crime writers. We have brothers in crime as well, but this started back in the 1980s, and it was an organization um uh, that has grown over the years, and it, our website is sistersincrime.org. We have chapters all across the country, and so I'm sending the readers there to find out more about this award. We give. It's the Eleanor Taylor Bland Crime Fiction Writers of Color Award, and we have been giving this award every year for emerging writers, unpublished writers, lightly published writers of color. This is African-American writers of color and other writers of color. And the award is $2,000. And so you know, I'm sending your listeners there. If you're uh, an emerging writer, an unpublished writer, a lightly published writer, you have an opportunity every year to apply for this award that allows you to do things that would allow you to get your first book out there. Oh, that is so great. Yeah, definitely. Especially if it involves any research or travel. Yeah. Yeah. And Frankie's list is actually, I was at to your I, book. I have a book that you have mentioned as we talk about this, about African-American mystery writers. And I had served as the national, one of the national past presidents for Sisters in Crime National. And so while I was president and later, we were talking about starting this list that would build on uh, the list of writers I compile in my uh, book about African-American mystery writers and add other writers of color and add writers that are uh, lesbian, gay, transgender writers, you know, other diverse writers. And we now have that list on our website so people can go to the website. It's intended for librarians and readers and others who want to go to the website and find diverse writers that they want to read. So... Um, really proud that we now have that there and we're adding to it. But we also have the Crime Writers of Color. It's the organization where you can find our website, you can find us on Twitter. So there are many more ways to find who's writing now than in the past. Yeah, that I, when I found that list, that was like, it was like somebody, you know, you, you dig and dig and then suddenly you find this uh, secret magical document that opens this whole world to you and i was like oh my goodness because <laughs> so now you need to follow up with crime writers of color and yes. find out who's come out more recently because Definitely. although we update the list as we're going along you that in real time you'll find your know, people on twitter and on websites and elsewhere so that list is a really good starting place especially for native american writers and other writers that you you might not have been reading or been able to find uh, you, know, you know, Latino, Latino writers, you know, um, writers in terms of sexuality, if you're looking for you know, those writers, you know, that's a really good place as well. So you know, we're doing our best to get out there and make people aware. And you mentioned your book, your uh, African-American mystery writer's book, a historical and thematic study. Like you said, you, you write works that are scholarly, but they're actually very approachable by non-scholars. Can you tell me yeah. a little bit about the process of writing that book? Yeah, this is actually, I don't really want to call it a sequel, although it is. My very first published book, after I finished my dis dissertation, I was living in Braveheart, Kentucky, lovely small town, but not, too, not really too much to do there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I looked for something to do. I wanted to write a book, and so I wrote um, a book that eventually uh, 
keen to be called Out of the Woodpile. I had another title in mind, but the publisher was concerned I might have been people. Okay. Uh, but it, because I, I wanted to reference a uh, racial slur that appeared in Agatha Christie's 1939 book that eventually came to be called And Then There Were Not. Ah, that yes. had a, a very different title in the first two. <laughs> you may know the titles, the earlier titles. But I went back and I drew a conversation in that book, uh, and I came up with Out of the Woodpile, and that became the title. But the book, the subtitle is Out of the Woodpile, Black Characters in Crime and Detective Fiction, and that came out in 1990. And I wanted to follow up after many more writers of color, African-American writers, writers of color were published. And so I went back later, the book that you're talking about, and did this book, and I think it was 2011 was the publication date. But I picked up all of the writers of color that I could uh, identify at the time. And that's why I started in the past. I, as I began to look at that, I realized I needed to start with slavery with people like Frederick Douglass and bring writers of color writing about crime and justice up to the present and then begin to write about mystery writers. So that was my process. Hmm. And it it really is. It's it's just fascinating to read because I'm like, I had no idea. You know, I, all the time, I'm, I had no idea. But there was... Uh... I found out a lot of things too as I was doing the research. And I still, even given that... There are some, as I was talking to someone recently about, there are writers who, in the 19th century, you were writing uh, dime novels, pulp fiction, and these are apparently writers, writers of color, and they're out there, And but I didn't have access to those dime novels and pulp fiction as I was writing. So you know, there are writers of color, at least one or two, who are writing uh, books that are short stories, I should say, that were being published in these novels, these dime novels, kind of publications that I didn't have access to that I could have talked about. Hmm. So I really began in the early 19th century, or early 20th century. I should say. Yeah. So how has that book been received, and do you plan to do another publication like that that captures more of the present, or are you using the websites more for that? It was well received. I was nominated for an Edgar and Anthony and won a McCavity. These are awards in the mystery world. So I was pleased with how it was received. You and it's still out there and available. So that's a good thing that it's still available. I don't have any immediate plans to go back to that because there are so many more writers of color now, and it would take me much longer to read the books and do the research. And so I'm happy to you know, let other people pick up and go on with that. I, I probably will come back to it at some point because it's hard to just leave that kind of thing. But right now I'm working on the 1939 historical thriller and I'm working on the Lizzie book and I want to do another Hannah book. And I have promised to do short stories for several uh, anthologies. And I'm also, I really, you know, I want to finally get my book about dress, appearance, and justice out, that nonfiction book dealing with clothing and appearance and how that actually plays out in terms of perception. So I started that book in the colonial period, and it ends up it ends up actually with Donald Trump and huh. the march in Charlottesville you know, featuring the neo-Nazis. So every day something new happens with that. So I want to get that one out there. So when I get all of that out and then when I have time, I'm keeping your records, but I have a lot more to do before I can go back and actually finish uh, a new book that will draw on recent writers of color. Wow. Well, you are busy. And plus you're teaching full time. So you have a full plate here. We're doing distance learning now, which is a really new experience for a lot of faculty. So you know, it's a different kind of thing, and you're interacting with students and doing a distance virtual meetings and all of that. It's just changed how most of us work and what we're able to do. Also because you know, it's harder to do some type of research when you're not able to go into the library which I really love going into physical libraries and mm -hmm. having that interaction. And even though a lot of things are available, 
spiritually. I really love going into the library and picking up the book and reading the book and having that. So that also is affecting how I do research and what I can do. So with Chester Himes, when he came out, that kind of was a big shift in terms of, my thought it was a big shift in terms of Black uh, authors writing mysteries. But you talk a lot about authors who came before Chester Himes. Could you tell us uh, some people we should be reading from that time period, and how should we approach that literature? Well, there are two I want to mention, because these are very available to readers. In fact, you can find a short story of one of these authors online. There's Pauline Elizabeth Hopkins. You can find a lot about her online. But she's been called by some of us the mother of the African-American mystery short story and novel. She's not writing what we would think of as strictly generic uh, mystery or crime fiction, but two of uh, one of her novels and one of her short stories has this crime fiction context that she's writing in. She was born in Portland, Maine in 1859, and around the turn of the 20th century, 1900 and after, she's writing these books, uh, and her Books or novels are being serialized in uh, magazines, uh, and she, she, she's an uh, editor, a publisher. She's really very busy in projects dealing with nonfiction. She's looking at racial discrimination, economic justice, women's role. You know, so she's very busy, and she's writing about slavery and the aftermath, and she's involved with these women's clubs, and she's very active in literary society. And so she ends up writing a book that I think is the first in mystery, uh, what I would call crime fiction by a woman of color you're writing. And she's in this book dealing with a situation that involves her character, who is a woman of color, and she is she gets caught up in the aftermath of slavery and what's happening with there. It's called uh, Hagar's Daughter, A Story of Southern Caste Prejudice in the South, in the Southwest. It's a very long subtitle there. But it's about this woman who, when her father, uh, this man she thinks of as her father, dies, and she is sold into slavery, and it's about this story about how she's separated from her husband, and she introduces, as far as I am aware of, this uh, the first female character who's a servant and also a sleuth. She becomes involved with a member of the Secret Service. Who, uh, it's a very complex mystery, but you know, it's really very readable. Uh, it's old-fashioned, but also very real, readable in terms of what she does, in terms of this mystery and the secret and this mystery man who's undercover trying to solve what's going on, and the lovers are reunited, and it's all about what happens to these people because of this woman you're being first sold and then later getting married and having these things happen to her. At the same time, uh, in the present, there is this you know, plot going on involving this young woman who's a servant and who becomes involved in this investigation. So it's really complex and you know, interesting type of novel. And the other I want to recommend is Rudolf Fischer. He was a doctor who died very young. He was 37 when he died in 1935. And he had been, many of people think of him as a Renaissance man. He was a doctor, a researcher. In fact, when it, a part of the research, uh, reason he died was that he was doing research uh, on x rays, uh, cancer research. He was uh, a novelist, a short story writer, a musician. Uh, he was active during the Harlem Renaissance. And his book, his novel, uh, he has two novels, but the one I want to mention, The Conjure Man Dies, was published in 1932. And the subtitle is A Mystery Tale of Dark Harlem. And what he writes is a traditional classic detective novel. And he sets it in Harlem. And he has a black homicide detective and a black physician. And they team up. The black physician is his amateur sleuth. And they team up to investigate this murder that takes place, the murder of this conjure man, who's also an African, highly educated African prince who's you know, a conjure man in Harlem. And the suspects are his clients who are in his waiting room waiting to talk to him when he's murdered. And so there's this mystery about who is actually killed and a mystery about why he's killed. And so it's really fascinating. 
And then later on, he has a short story where he brings back these same two characters, John Archer's Nose, published in 1935, that is available in the anthology featuring Fisher's books and also in other places. But in that case, you know, his physician and the detective come back again, and he's dealing with science versus superstition in both of these publications. Okay, now you know you you just increased my to be read list a little higher, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> you can find your know, Fisher. His books are available. You know, he has another uh, book featuring the two amateur detectives that appear in the Conjurman Dive because you have two uh, sets of sleuths: the physician and the police detective, and then there's the, the two amateur detectives who are moving men, and they have your know, walk-ons in this novel. There's the protagonist of the first book, and they have walk in the second. So, a lot going on. In fact, you know, it's really fascinating because he's dealing with Harlem at the time. And so you have your know, uh, middle-class people and working-class people, and they're all interacting around what's going on. Wow. that That is so... Thank you for sharing that. I, I'm sure everyone's going to go and... Uh look them up and get them because it's just so fascinating reading especially things set in the past because it's like a whole nother world and how do how do black sleuths operate in a world that's uh, not as kind uh, that's a gentle way of saying it it's fascinating yeah, Fisher, uh, Fisher is particularly interesting because he has only one white character in the book and he's a medical examiner and his the detective and the other black uh, detectives, the lead detective and the other black detectives, the police officers, are people who are actually, in real life, you know, would have been patrolling, working in Harlem. In fact, in one of his stories, uh, his short stories, he has uh, a character who arrives from, he's a migrant who comes from the South. He's fleeing uh, a situation in the South. He arrives in Harlem. And so he's a country boy suddenly in Harlem. And he's fascinated when he sees this police, this police officer in Harlem directing traffic, and he stops you know, dead in the street to look at this police detect, uh, officer because he's never seen uh, a police officer in the South, where he's coming from. And so you know, Fisher is dealing with that same kind of thing, where he has his police detective is newly promoted, and he's in Harlem, and he's you know, investigating this crime. And the only white character who appears is this medical examiner who appears briefly and then is gone again. So it's really a story about you know, how this police detective and this physician drawing on their skills solved this crime. Yeah, definitely, definitely want to put that on a list to read. That's just so fascinating. And I, and I never thought about that, that if you came from the South where you never saw black people in any authority especially wearing a gun, and then all of a sudden you go somewhere. And I see why people thought of <clears throat> Harlem as Mecca, because it was so different from where they were. Yeah, it's really interesting, you as a crime historian, I have to mention this. It's really interesting because there's this period after uh, the Civil War, during Radical Reconstruction, when in places like my hometown of Danville, Virginia, the last capital of the Confederacy, you know, as Jefferson Davis is fleeing, he stops in Danville on the train and stays a few days. So with the federal troops during Reconstruction, they're in southern cities like Danville and Wilmington, North Carolina. And during this period in Virginia, your know, black politicians are working with the northerners, the northern Republicans, because that's the Republican Party at that point, coming down from the north. And in places like Danville, we really did have African-American police officers. There were African-American members of city council, and African-Americans were active in uh, you know, the political and community life in terms of holding elective office along with the uh, Republicans, the Northern Republicans. But then what happens is that in Danville, in Wilmington, there is the that party is overthrown, and then you have the solid Democratic South put in place. And so when we have people beginning to migrate from the, north, from the South to the North, at that point, yes, it is a time when they would not have seen black police officers, but their mothers and fathers or grandmothers might remember that brief period after Reconstruction. 
uh, during Reconstruction, I should say, when federal troops were in the South, when there were actually black police officers and black you know, elected officials and you know, black senators and so on. So it's, there is a period, and then it's gone briefly, and it doesn't reappear again until we began to get into that period leading up to the civil rights era in the 20th century. Fascinating. The world of mysteries has changed a lot since Chester Himes. Is there any one big thing you notice the difference? And I know that's a big time period from Chester Himes to now, but is there a big thing? Well, yeah, I think the... There are two things that sort of come together here, and I'll mention the first in terms of women. When we're looking at Chester Hahn, there's Pauline Hopkins, and then after her, you know, nothing much happening with women. And then you get into the period in the 80s and 90s when not only are African American and other writers of color appearing, but women writers are appearing. And so you know, that's a big difference in terms of who is actually writing the book. But also, when we get into that period, particularly in the 90s, and again, particularly now, many more writers of color are appearing. Uh, and so when we talk about you know, who is writing, we don't just mention Chester Himes. We can mention all those other writers, you know, actor Walter Mosley, and writing at the same time as Walter Mo- Mosley, and still writing. So you know, when we look at the crime writers of color, there are many more of us who have published and emerging writers and you know, writers who are just beginning. And there's a real excitement around this now because of you know, the whole movement for diversity and inclusion. And so it's a time when we can actually attract crossover readers. Chester Himes did that as well. But you know, then there was the period when there was some good fiction being published as urban street lit or street fiction and not too many white readers crossing over to read it. So now we have you know, uh, writers of color being that are publishing that really good fiction and also hardball fiction and traditional fiction and all kinds of fiction that we were not being published as writing during Chester Hines era. Well, I I feel as a reader, it's just great. I I remember when I was in my 20s, which was some time ago, you know, it was such a rarity going to Cole's bookstore, which doesn't exist, and uh, or B. Dalton, that doesn't exist. And you and, you know, oh, my God, it's a book by a black person. Uh-huh. Iceberg Slim and that whole group. Yeah. and yeah. But now the world has changed, and it's such a rich world. And really, really happy as a reader. And I, I'm hoping that doing things like this and talking with great people like you can help other readers discover this great wealth of literature out there. And, you know, people have been fans of mysteries, but, but I can never really find too many that have someone who looks like me. Back in the 1990s, <laughs> and, uh, there was a pre Bauchikan. Bauchikan is the major annual international conference for prime writers of all kinds. So in 1990, 1996, I think it's the year I was, you know, this is in Minneapolis, you know, at, just before the pre Bauchikan conference bringing together all these crime writers. Uh, the University of Minnesota and the Givens Foundation sponsored a symposium of crime writers of color, black right, crime writers at the time, African-American crime writers. And you know, it was a great conference, and we have not done anything since then. It's going, what, like 25 years now? Mm-hmm. And what I'm going to be able to do in spring of 2021, uh, if all goes according to plan, is bring together crime writers of color virtually for a conference here, here virtually at the University at Albany, as a part of our Justice and Multiculturalism in the 21st Century Project. So I'm going to be doing this virtually, and we're going to be bringing together writers of color from all over the country and internationally, and we're going to do panels and have a speaker, and this is going to be the lead-in for the Sisters in Crime chapter uh, conference that we, our annual chapter conference that we're having, but it's going to be sponsored by the School of Criminal Justice and the University at Albany and going to start on March 17th and then we're going to have all day on March 18th and I'm going to, a lot, you'll see lots of things coming out about this as we go on, go on, but I just wanted to plug it now. Great. Is this only for people who are writers? 
Oh no no! It's going to be it's going to be for academics. It's, it's going to be for readers, and we're going to be advertising and trying to get anyone who's interested in you know, books by writers of color and how they see social issues like crime and justice and what they deal with in their books and publishing and diversity issues and all of that. So anyone who has interest in any aspect of that, we want them to come and join us for what we're going to be doing, the webinars, the Zoom meetings, and you know, they'll be talking about you know, just what they, their place in the world as writers of color and the books that they write and the short stories and the nonfiction. Because most writers of color, as with most writers, have day jobs. And they have things that they're doing, causes that they're active around. And what we're going to be talking about is you know, how uh, their fiction intersects with uh, their real lives and how they see the world. And they'll be talking about what it means to be a writer at this moment. And so readers will have an opportunity to you know, ask questions uh, and you know, get responses. And we'll also have people in various disciplines, various fields, who will be interacting with us. And since we're in Albany and this project that we do as part of the Criminal Justice School of Criminal Justice reaches out to people who are active in types, different types of organizations. And we have a big mailing list and we're in the capital of Albany. You can expect some of those people will also be tuning in to uh, take part in the discussion. So this sounds great. Now, how do I, I'm selfishly thinking only of myself. Now, how do I stay on top of this? How do I keep informed? Yeah, we're going to be tweeting about this as we go on, so you'll know about this. Uh, it's going to be posted on our website, the Justice and Multiculturalism in the 21st Century website for the School of Criminal Justice, University at Albany. I'll be tweeting about it often, giving that information over again, over and over again. You'll see uh, the Crime Writers of Color will be, we have a website, you'll see it there, you'll see it being tweeted out. So. You won't be able to miss it. We will be advertising, believe me, because I want to get a large audience for this. We'll have the, the symposium itself, and then you'll be able to access as webinar if oh. you're not able to you know, tune in for all of it. Yeah. That is so good. I am so excited. I'm ready for my well. You know, a lot of people are ready for 2020 to end, but I'm, I'm ready for Yeah, it's March. part of the curse year. We're all <laughs> so eager to get into 2021 and hope it's better. But just think, once 2021 gets here, all the cool stories that people are going to put in 2020, because, you know, 2020 will have the reputation of being this crazy, horrible year. So, <laughs> Well, I, I don't know how. I, Lizzie, of course, is in 2004. Hannah McCabe is now in... 2020, and so she's in the Hannah McCabe series at the period leading up to the 2020 election. Mm. Uh, I have a third party character who is far right and is about to arrive in Albany, in my fictional Albany, my parallel alternate universe Albany, and he is going to cause some issues for Hannah when he arrives, but I don't know who's going to win the election in 2020 in my book, <laughs> uh, because my characters, I have, my Republican character is uh, a Latino, uh, Hispanic woman, and then I have a character who is a Democrat who is running, but in my parallel universe, my female candidate won the election in 2016, the Democrat, and now she's her vice president, who is African American, actually biracial character. He is now running for you know, president in mm. her place because she's got this backlash, and now you know, she's uh, yielded the place to him. So he's the Democrat running. Wow. So I don't know how that's going to turn out. <laughs> Fascinating. You just keep making me want to get more books. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have the plot for the the next Hannah McCabe book. Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited about that. I've just got to find the time to sit down and write it and then figure out how I'm going to get it out. You know, with the new technology, it's easy to do it. Just put it out there yourself. But I don't have time for all that marketing. So I want to find yeah. someone else who's going to do this. That is the key. But but please let, let me know because uh, I will definitely talk about it. You definitely have a fan here. With <laughs> It's good to know I have a place to come and talk about this. Oh, always. Anytime. Anytime. So, 
if people want to follow you now, now we I promise we won't just ask you every day when's the book coming, when's the book coming. But <laughs> if we want to follow you and stay on top of your new publications, how can what's the best way to do that? They should go to my website, frankiewhitebailey.com. It's a new updated website. My webmaster just you know, updated the website, although you know, the picture is not updated because I haven't gone out and done that with the pandemic and everything mm-hmm. going on. So I still have the photo from the ha- last Anna McKay book. They can go. I'm about to start doing a newsletter, which I've been promising to do forever. But if they go, they can sign up for my newsletter, and in the newsletter, I will keep them updated. And they'll also be able to come to the website, and they can follow me on Twitter at Frankie Y. Bailey. I do you know, go on Twitter perhaps more often than I actually update the newsletter, which I have yet to get out. But I promise I will be getting out newsletters as things are changing. And I keep on my website, I have to update that now that the new website is coming out, but I also have my events listed there. Right now, they're all virtual events, but they can see where I am going to be. Because they're virtual uh, events, they can now you know, connect with me much more easily than waiting for me to be out on the trail you know, during tours or whatever. Yeah, I, I think the one great thing that's come out of the pandem- pandemic, it's pushed people to use the virtual tools, but then they found, oh my goodness, it's not as bad as it I thought it would be. And it's allowed a lot of people who never could connect to connect. So I'm excited yeah. about that one aspect. Well, I invite you and your uh, listeners to you know, connect with me uh, at Bouchicon and other places. But I do want to say our Sisters in Crime chapter here in Albany has a chapter meeting every third Saturday. The meeting begins at 1030 Eastern Time. Our guest of honor, our guest speaker, I should say, comes on at 11 o'clock. So we have these programs where, wherever you are in the country. You can you know, come to our join us for that meeting and you know, see our chapter in action and join us for whoever the speaker is. Okay. Frankie, thank you. This has been so great. I, again, you, you're one of my heroes, and I really, really appreciate you spending time talking with me. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? No, and I thank you so much for doing this. And I thank you for saying I'm one of your heroes. And I'm, I have to say to your listeners, it's Saturday morning and I'm, I'm just waking up. So if I'm slow thinking about this, it's because I don't actually wake up well until afternoon. That, that morning, getting back to the writing process, in the morning, I gradually wake up working. And so today I just tried to come right to the telephone. So I hope this makes sense, what I was saying. <laughs> no, it, it was great. It, it was so good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I mean, this was great, too. I really appreciate your show and what you're doing. Thank you, Frankie. This means so much to me, especially since this is the 100th episode of I Found This Great Book. And I can't think of any better thing to do than to talk to Frankie Bailey. In the interview... Frankie mentioned that there is going to be a meeting of the Sister in Crimes Albany chapter this Saturday. That's October 17, 2020. So depending upon when you listen to this, you may have missed it. If you're interested in attending that, email me at Curtis at IFoundThisGreatBook.com. I'm going to get the link from Frankie and I will send it to you. If this podcast and the directory have been of value to you, one way you could help is by joining my Patreon. I just started one. You can go to patreon.com slash I found this great book. Join up. Any support you can give would greatly be appreciated. Of course, I do this because I love doing it, but if I can get some support, it actually helps me do it better. Or You can also support me and help me out by just telling a friend about the podcast and the directory and the website. If you would do that, I would really, really appreciate it. Well, everyone, 
Thank you for 100 episodes, and I'm ready to do another 100. Everyone, please stay safe and have a great reading day.